Welcome to Campbellsville Baptist Church. I'm Brad Lauer, the discipleship pastor, and it's my honor and privilege to be with you today. And that I feel honored that you've even tuned in or pulled this up to watch as we uh, study God's Word together. We continue our study in the book of Psalms, uh, looking at six different Psalms over the course of these sessions. And so we're in the fourth one. We're going to be looking at Psalms 95 today. And so um, it's in the fourth book of the Psalms. But. Um, and so we're going to look and talk about it today and see where God leads us and what God wants to teach us as we engage Him in His Word. And so let's pray and we will get started. God, we thank You for today and the ability we have to connect. Not just connect um, with each other, but we connect with You. And so God, as we dive into Your Word and study this 95th Psalm, head up, allow us, help us, to discern your will today for our lives. Guide us, direct us, encourage us, challenge us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're looking at Psalm 95. We're going to uh, dive in in just a minute. Uh, so let's look at a little uh, preview of it because we want to understand what the psalm is and who wrote the psalm or at least the purpose for the psalm before we dive in helps give us a little background information as we go in. And we think, and many have, um, many theologians and, and biblical scholars say this has been composed for the Festival of Booths, a week-long celebration that celebrated the harvest and Israel's exodus from e Egypt. They would erect temporary living quarters for the week to remind them of God's care while they wandered the wilderness. In other words, they wanted to relive the experience of moving around and traveling that great journey. And so they would they would set up tents and things and movable and removable uh, living quarters outside of the cities and do that in the countryside just to remind them of where they came from, where the, what their ancestors went through and what God did for them. This, this, this psalm is a combination of a hymn of praise and a warning from God. You see, the festival of Booths was a joyful time. People lived and worked together for six days while the harvest was gathered. And so they, these temporary housing places were set up basically as a camp out near the fields. The harvesting food called for praising God. Have you ever praised God after you've walked out of the grocery store? Thanking God for those who have prepared or had planted and harvested and delivered your groceries to a store where you can just walk in? Have you ever praised God for being able to walk into a grocery store and pick up ground beef or um, chicken uh, so that you can go home and cook for your family? Have you ever thanked God for the people who, pro who provided all those goods and services for you to feed your family or to donate to those families who are in such dire need. You know, at Campbellsville Baptist Church, we have a, a feeding program that we, we construct that, that we feed and have fed um, during periods of time during the year, usually during the summer when school is out, anywhere, depending on the year, 20 to 27 families. And so it, it's just a joy to remember that as we take those bags of food to families, that somebody did plant them, help nurtured them as they grew and then they harvested the produce and then they shipped it off and then there was a factory or a plant that made those products and then they got delivered to a grocery store so that our people in our church can donate towards that or uh, either financially or actually bringing the food and it's just a great a great thing and so have you ever praised God after you walked out of your local grocery store sometimes the Israelites would complain, however, and we, we, we can read the Old Testament and see their vicious cycle of complaining and wandering away from God, and they would complain instead of rejoicing, which is where we see the divide and the tone change in this psalm. So we're going to read it and see what, where the divide happens, and then we're going to go through and we're going to discuss it uh, verse by verse. So chapter or Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and exalt, ex extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, 
Let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flocks under His care. Today, if only you would hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the wilderness where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years I was angry with that generation. I said, they are people whose hearts go astray. They have not known my ways. So I declare an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. There was a transition. Did you find it? It's around verse 8. A warning from God. Yeah, quit complaining. Don't harden your hearts. And so we're going to look at this. We're going to start um, with verses 1 and 2 where it says, Come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout about. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Just as highways are lined with signs that give us instructions, the psalmist called for everyone to come and to worship God. We talked about that in our last session about preparing our hearts and preparing ourselves for worship, about going up to Jerusalem, going up to the temple. But everyone is to come and worship God. The two verbs that convey psalmist exhortation. One is shout, sing for joy or shout with joy, depending on your, let us shout aloud um, and let us come before with thanksgiving and extol him. Shout triumphantly. While we were called here to worship here with action, worship was a noun first. Come to worship. God created us to worship him. In the very beginning, that was the relationship Adam and Eve had with God. It was one of intimacy, but it's also we were created to worship. There are many songs written about how we were created to worship. Our state of being is, is to be made ready before the physical is exercised. If you, if you look in Amos, I don't know if I'll find it. Let's see. Amos 5.23. got to find it. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. In other words, hearts got to be right to worship. We've got to prepare ourselves. Remember, better is one day in the court in your temple than a thousand elsewhere. We want to we wanna be prepared. We want to be ready to worship with the holy God. We must prepare ourselves for worship. Take me away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen. God rejected their worship because the relationship with him and each other was out of order. So what does this mean? I mean, wait a minute. If he rejects our worship when our relationship with one another and our attitude towards him is indifferent, what does that say about me and you today? What does that say about the culture of our churches today. What does that say about society today? We have to be careful. But we also see Jesus saying this in Matthew 15, 8. People worship with their lips, but their mouths are far from me. It goes back to the old saying, our lifestyle does not emulate or imitate what we're saying. We come to church, and the old adage is, you come to church and you get all dressed up and you're a Sunday morning Christian but you live very differently Monday through Saturday. In Psalm um, 95, 3 through 5, it says, For the Lord is great, is the great God, the great King above all gods. In His hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain and the mountains and the mountain peaks belong to Him. The sea is His, for He made it, and His hands form the dry land. So who are we worshiping? Who are we worshiping? We're worshiping the great God, the king above all gods. He he holds the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks. They all belong to him. The sea. In other words, he's the God of creation. He's the God of everything we can comprehend or understand or know. For the Lord is great, is a great God, the great king above all gods. The psalmist identifies God here as Yahweh. Remember the, infant, the intimate covenant God. 
eliminating any impression about who he is. He is the Lord, the one, the only, not some graven image, not some dead God that sits on a shelf, but the true God. All around the, all around the Israelite people, they, others worshiped many other gods and also had idols. And this verse contrasts God with their pantheons of false gods. God was proclaiming and was being proclaimed king and the one true God. In verse 4, in his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are also his. The depths of the earth and the mountain peaks represent two very different extremes. One is hidden beneath the ground or beneath the water, while the other towers above the landscape. Either way, God controls from the top to the bottom all that is seen and all that is unseen. It may be insignificant to you or I, but He is over everything. Then in verse 5, the, five, the sea is His. The sea is His, for He made it. And His hands formed the dry land. You know, the sea is a hidden mystery, if you think about it, especially during that time. And even today, we don't know everything that's under the water. We don't know what everything looks like under there, how deep. We have an idea of how deep, but, but specifically, we don't know. There are places under the sea that we have never explored. One, it's so deep and so dark, and the pressure of the sea is so great, we don't have anything that can go down there. But yet we know that there are animals deeper than we can imagine. There are terrains down there that we don't understand. God is so vast that in His creature or His creation, the sea sprouted up dry land at His command. Think about that. In the beginning, when it talks about in Genesis, what does it say in Genesis in the first chapter, the creation story? Now the heavens, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said that the light was good, and he separated the light from darkness and called the light day, and darkness he called night. And he goes on, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky. Let the water under the sea be gathered to one place. Let the dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and gathered the waters he called seas. You see, God did that. God did that. And now we're going to move on into verses 6 and 7. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the, the Lord, our Maker. Amazing. All creation, all creation is, dir is directed to God and to approach Him with humility and reverence, bowing down before Him. I believe we have forgotten that in our culture today, that we don't enter worship as in awe and reverence and fear of God. We come in expecting, expecting uh, to enjoy it expecting the music and the sermon to appeal to us instead of us giving everything we have before a holy God. You know, the Hebrew verb, verb word for worship means to prostrate oneself, to get down, to prostrate. You can either be laying or kneeling. But that means you make yourself vulnerable. You show respect and honor to that in which you are prostrate in front of. So to bow down means to fall on one knees and to bend your back in homage. While the first verb represents a spirit of worship, the second represents the posture for it, to kneel, to bow. Bowing and kneeling are appropriate expressions of humility before God, but there are other postures that show other expressions, such raising hands in supplication or looking up in acknowledgement of Him. So, there's more than one way to do that. 
And you see that a lot in today's worship where we, people raise hand or they look up when they sing or worship or pray. But we also have to remember the, the kneeling, the bowing before God. And we may say, well, that's what we do when we pray. That is true. But there are other ways to express that in other times. And in verse 7 it says, For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. Today, if only you would hear His voice. Our role in the relationship with God isn't just servanthood. We see through, throughout Scripture, God characterizes a, a, of love, for his creation and care for his covenant people. Remember, David wrote in the psalm, being a good shepherd. And that's who God is for us. And that's who Jesus became for us. We see the analogy of a shepherd and a sheep and care and protection. A, sheep, a shepherd provides for his sheep from the dangers all around. Remember we talked about the rod and thy staff. They comfort me. The club to defend, the hook to bring away from danger or to draw back into the fold and the stick to lean on to provide rest and comfort and a position of observation because the shepherd couldn't lay down while watching the sheep. Had to be upright to be able to get cast his, va his gaze over the flock to see potential danger, to be able to see what was around the corner, to be able to see when one would run off. He makes sure we have fresh water and plenty to eat, treats our injuries and restores us to health. Everything we are and have must be attributed to God in our lives. You see, He is the Good Shepherd, for He is our God and we are His people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. We are, we, we are those sheep. and We discussed that in Psalm 23 a couple sessions ago. And so as we make the transition into the rest of the psalm, in 7 through 11, or 7 through, yeah, 11, let's, let's, for He is our God and we are His pasture. And, and, and today, if only you would hear His voice. In the last of that verse, it goes on to say, Do not harden your hearts as you did in Meribah, as you did that day in Massa, in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. This is God talking to the people now when they came to him and he senses some type of, 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 of hardened heart and complaint. They tried, though they had seen what I did. They tried me, though they saw what I had done. Forty years I was angry with that generation. I said, they are people whose hearts go astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger. They never enter my rest. In other words, they will never enter the promised land. So he's giving them a warning, reminding them they are they celebrate the festival of booths to celebrate the harvest and give God thanks and remind them of their wanderings. And so he's reminding them that while you were in the wilderness, you turned your back on me. And here's what happened to that whole generation. It's a reminder. Listen to God in verse 7. It's a, it's a, it's a vital component of our relationship. Jesus said that the ideal shepherd calls his sheep by name. And the sheep only respond to their shepherd, not anyone else. Obedience is implicit in hearing God's voice. Are you listening? Are you hearing God's voice? Because God is calling you and calling, calling me by name. Especially when we're out of step, out of line. You know, we, we are warned in verse 8 about ignoring God, failing, failing to teach about Him, failing to worship Him, pointing out Israel's past failures as illustrations. They complained. They complained they didn't think they had enough water. They complained they didn't have enough food. They complained when they didn't like the food anymore. They complained because they thought they were in danger. They complained, I think, like many of us do, when you spend too much time together, you start looking inward instead of outward. As churches and, and even Sunday school classes, when all you do is focus on each other, what happens is you start looking at each other and you start noticing the defects 
or the flaws that maybe someone else has and they notice yours and you know the shortcomings that we have not that they're bad but that that but they're just we're not perfect and what happens when we look at each other we start picking one another apart so if a church can continue even sunday school groups or small groups um, as they do minister to one another they have to have an outward focus as well because when we're when we are with our backs to one another we don't notice as much about where somebody's weaker and stronger and those kind of things because now we're shoulder to shoulder looking out into the community looking through the eyes of God to see where we're needed, to see where, where God needs us to go, and to see who we can help and who we can love and who we can minister to. We must be able to be shaped by God and not hardened or stuck in our ways. We've got to get out of our comfort zones. We've got to get out of our ruts. We've got to get out of the familiar, the comfortable, the routine. Israel's failure to trust God led to all but two of the 600,000 men Moses led out of Egypt to not enter the promised land. Remember the two? Moses, Joshua, Caleb, so three. No, Moses didn't make it. Sorry, I went, I went rogue there on you. Even Moses didn't enter because of his disobedience. Only Joshua and Caleb. See, if I just keep reading my notes and not making stuff up. A whole generation did not enter what was promised to them, his rest or the promised land, because of their testing and disobedience of him. We may be getting those type of warnings even today in our culture. Are we going to follow God? Are we going to give God our total trust? Are we going to say, we know how to do it better, God? Maybe that's the question that's being asked of us today. Entering God's rest only comes from worshiping God continuously, both individually and corporately. Worship is not just an event or a large gathering in a room. Worship should happen each and every day of our lives. We should worship God, praise God, thank God, almost as we, as we breathe in and we breathe out. And so as we bring this to some type of conclusion and come up with a few um, points of emphasis or summary, there are four. The first one is all creation should celebrate its creator. We know that God created. Now there's debate and there's argument about, in my opinion, about how that happened. But I think there's all the evidence that we need that it someone had to start that process and so God created therefore we should celebrate because we were created by him you and I were created in his image and so we should celebrate our creator God second one God should be worshipped as our creator when is the last time you thank God for for your life the, that he created you in your, in your mother's womb and you're a part of this creation and that you have an opportunity to make this creation better because you're in it. Because God created each of us for a purpose. My purpose and your purpose may be different specifically, but generally they're the same. To go and make disciples, to make this world a better place, to help spread the good news. That is our objective. That is our covenant agreement with God. There is no plan B there. It is, we are one generation away from not hearing the gospel. So it's up to you and me to share the gospel. No matter where we are, we could be in the hospital. We can witness to our nurses and to our doctors and to the people who clean our room and the people who draw our blood or give us medicine. We can witness to those when we go to the grocery store, when we go to the restaurants, or when we go to any other place of business, or when someone comes to our house, the, the mailman, the garbage collector, the anyone, the exterminator, anyone who comes to our homes, we can do things to show them the love of Christ. And so that's our objective. All people should approach worship of the Creator with humility and reverence. If you remember back to Psalm 84, we talked about that. And so in 95, it continues with 
how we come before God. We have to prepare ourselves to come and be excited, almost giddy as in Psalm 84. But we also have to come with reverence and humility and not arrogance and pride and maybe um, dissatisfaction or just being neutral, not caring. We're just showing up to show up, maybe to be seen or maybe because we think we have to. We need to prepare ourselves to be there. And then we enter that room. We enter that place privately or corporately with humility and reverence. Now we can celebrate and dance and raise our hands and clap. And that's also a, a sign of reverence, a sign of humility. Because we're giving all, as long as we're doing that in celebrating who God is. Or not, not just because we like the music. But that is a way we connect to God. Like, da like King David danced before the Lord. Bel and number four, believers must consistently worship God corporately and privately. We've talked about that multiple times. That worship is not an event. I said last time that I did a youth theme one year called wall, the wall. Worship, a living lifestyle. It's something we do. Day to day, moment to moment, we breathe in and we breathe out as, and worship God in the process. C.S. Lewis says, A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship Him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. But God wills our good, and our good is to love Him. And to love Him, we must know Him. And if we know Him, shall fall on our faces. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that um, we can come to you and worship. We may be excited to be there, but at the same time, we must approach you as the creator God, the one who created all. And in that time, we also have to come with you with open hearts, with on our knees, whether physically or figuratively, and with humility and with awe and wonder. And so, God, we just give that to you. We, we, we know that we have to be better. We know that we must spend more time preparing to meet with you and not complaining that we should come that way and we should be reminded of the ways of our past where you have forgiven us and you have challenged us and you have corrected us and so that when we enter and leave worship we leave change because we've encountered you there and God help us to not be like we have been in the past where we've come in with a chip on our shoulder in worship and say wow me today preacher man or wow me today music pastor it ought to be us expressing our wow to a holy God. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a couple questions. How can you, and how can I, I'm asking me as I ask you, better prepare ourselves to enter into private and corporate worship experiences with humility, with contriteness, and with awe and fear, but yet give God everything. How would worship change? How would a worship experience change if we all came in with the same goal, to praise and worship God, not to critique and not to be disinterested? Just some questions to ponder as you do. And if you have questions about anything we've talked about today, I made a couple flubs in there and you can let me know about it. But um, feel free to call us in the church office. The number is 270-465-8115. Or you can uh, look us up on the web at campbellsvillebaptistchurch.com and um, look through the website and contact us through email or whatever to uh, ask us questions, uh, any of the pastoral staff. We'd love to get to know you and connect with you. We'd also love for you to join us for worship each and every Sunday morning 
And you can worship in your chair, watching online, whether on Facebook, YouTube, or our website. At 10.30 every Sunday, click on the live button on either one of those three venues. Or you can come and be a part of us here in our sanctuary. We'd love to have you. May God bless you on your journey.